This is part 12 in a series of videos in which I am repairing and restoring an IBM 5120 vintage computer system. In the previous videos I got as far as restoring the chassis, the power supply, electronics box and various pieces of hardware. I have since been going through the various electronic cards and doing the best I can to try and fix those before powering them up. I'll show those in a future video. In this video I want to look at this. It is of course the CRT monitor assembly. These are fairly standard and this type of uh, CRT monitor was used in a lot of equipment of the time. So there's plenty of information around for these. And what I've been doing so far with this is just going through the schematic for it. Um, looking for any uh, faulty components. I found a couple of capacitors uh, that were shorted so I've replaced those. Um, as you can see it needs a very good clean but uh, I'll do that once I've got it working. And uh, these are very straightforward, very simple and as I say very standard so they're quite easy to work on. Uh, the two basic forms, there's the uh, low voltage DC version where you plug DC power directly into the controller board and then there's this version which has the uh, mains transformer and rectifier built into it. And uh, either way, very straightforward, there's nothing really complex in working on these, just the usual precautions because of the uh, very high voltage that's uh, present on this. This particular one goes up to 12,000 volts, they can go higher, uh, so you do need to be fairly careful, especially when you consider the fact that the CRT itself acts as a, uh, a very large capacitor. So. Uh, you need to be um, fairly certain that if you do need for any reason to disconnect um, the EHT cable that you have fully discharged the um, CRT first. Uh, if you want to see how to do that then go back and look at the uh, similar video I made for the MDS system um, but really it's just using a, a grounded tool with an insulated uh, handle to um, uh, just push it up underneath the insulation cap and fully discharge the CRT to the chassis before you disconnect anything. Uh, as I say I found a couple of uh, caps, I've replaced those. There are a few more in here that look a bit um, dodgy. It's usually when they're sitting at an angle like this it's often because the bases have started to bulge but these just weren't uh, soldered into the board properly. I have checked it and it's fine. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is um, power this up. I prefer to test them uh, independently of the uh, main system uh, simply because it's one less complication if there's nothing on the CRT it's one less thing to uh, consider and be concerned about when you're trying to fault find in the electronics. It's, uh, it can be a complex task getting something on the display so it's nice to know in advance that the display is uh, at least working. Very similar approach I'll take uh, on this that I did on the MDS monitor, so if you've seen that video then uh, you might find this one a bit dull. Um, Similar sort of thing, it's just figuring out the connections which you can get from the uh, service information uh, and then it's really just uh, making up uh, a simple interface adapter as I did before so I can drive this from um, a few signal generators. That then just plugs on to uh, the connector that would normally go to the machine itself. And all we have going to this is we have a pot for the external brightness control. Uh, if you don't fit that you'll get nothing on the CRT because the brightness will effectively be turned right down all the time. Uh, we then have ground and it's a common ground for um, the three inputs that we're going to be applying. Uh, we then have um, horizontal drive, the video input and uh, vertical drive and it's just really making sure that I select suitable frequencies for these signals on the signal generators. Okay, so I'll turn the screen around so we can see the front and what I'll do now is turn on the power. This is a 240 volt uh, version so I do need to be careful because there's quite a lot of exposed uh, wiring on the back of this and I've got the signal generator set up as I did with the MDS monitor to give me a pattern on the screen. So I'll power this up now. Checking the current drawn. Should be quite low at this point because there's no drives going into the monitor so it's just in idle mode and that looks fine. So I'll now switch on the uh, vertical horizontal drive and that should get the monitor uh, to show a raster once it's warmed up. 
I'll just move these lights back out of the way so we can see the screen more clearly. And as we can see, the screen is now starting to light up. I'll turn the brightness up. If you've seen flicker on the uh, camera, that is just because of the camera shutter speed. Uh, there's no flicker visible on the uh, screen itself. Uh, one thing I can see, which you can probably see as well, are these bright lines uh, going at an angle across the screen. At the end of each sweep, the gun has to sweep back rapidly to the start of the next line and that does leave these what are called retrace lines it's just uh, the, the beam goes across the screen and rapidly goes back these um, retrace lines are normally blanked out by the control electronics but because we don't have this driven from the control electronics uh, there is no retrace blanking which is why we can see them but that wouldn't normally be visible on the um, the machine itself it's just purely because we don't have this driven through the proper electronics but it will still allow us to display video information on the display so I'll do that now I'll turn on the um, signal generator that's driving the video input it's just set to generate pulses at the moment that are at a frequency that should cause vertical uh, bands to appear it's not synchronized so they will drift but we should still be able to see them fairly clearly and I'll turn the brightness down to what we'd expect it to be uh, within the machine and then we should get some fairly well defined vertical bands and what we're looking for here is very nice um, vertical lines with no kind of jagged edges uh, and also a very distinct step between the dark and the light sections I'll just try and synchronize this a little bit better okay so as I say, we're looking for very good distinct lines between the light and dark sections and that is a good indication as to the bandwidth of the system. The sharper the definition, then the higher the bandwidth of the system. And what I can do is change the pattern that we're applying to the monitor. And as we can see here, I can apply some very short pulses and these are pulses of varying amplitude so what we should see are some very narrow vertical lines of varying brightness and the important thing here is that the the step between the dark area and the light area should be very distinct you can ignore these lines going back that's just an artifact of the fact we don't have this uh, synchronized but as I say what we're looking for is uh, a very distinct um, light and dark vertical bands and that gives us a very good indication that the monitor has good bandwidth and is going to be able to successfully display information on the screen. Also looking um, for signs of screen burn um, where if the monitor has been left on for a long period of time with a static image there might be some permanent uh, marks left on the phosphor within the tube. Nothing I can do about it but it is nice to know if it's actually there. So. What I can do is put on a, a different waveform and we can see quite severe screen burn on this tube. These are the dark areas. If you imagine there's an area that would normally display text, uh, you can see kind of like shadows of where the text was originally displayed, especially on the left here where the text would have been um, most, most uh, commonly displayed. But it's, it goes right over to here as well. Um, so there is quite severe uh, screen burn on here. It won't stop the monitor from being usable uh, but it will be fairly apparent uh, once we get the machine up and running. Um, having said that, the monitor is working fine. It's going to certainly give us a fairly good picture. So what I'll do now is I'll power it off. I'll take it out to the workshop, give it a very good clean. I'll refit the uh, guard. I took this off so I could uh, replace the capacitors and test the board. Uh, and then I'll get back on camera, give it another test to make sure it still works and then we can bolt it back into the uh, chassis on the IBM. So I've given the monitor a good clean, it's come up uh, very nicely. I can't do anything about the screen burn other than replace the tube but I won't be doing that. Uh, it will work uh, quite adequately for what we're trying to do here. I've replaced the PCB cover 
have given the entire uh, chassis a good uh, clean and going over and it looks fine now it does look much better much cleaner and uh, there are no scratches or uh, bad marks on the face of the tube so we'll give it a final test before we fit it back into the chassis just to make sure that uh, I haven't broken it turn on the drive and we'll wait for it to warm up and see if we get an image and indeed we do I'll just change the waveform going into the video drive so we can get something a bit more indicative on the screen and there we go so as we can see very nice defined uh, images apologies for any flicker on the screen that's uh, as I say just due to the camera refresh rate I'll try a few different waveforms and you'll see um, what we're getting so we've got a staircase going in now to show the grayscale inverse bar and then what we've got here is some um, high frequency uh, effectively noise going in um, but what we're looking for is of course the well-defined vertical bars of varying intensities and we're getting a very nice range of intensities from black right through to uh, full white uh, they're all showing very good uh, definition between the white and the uh, dark sections so this monitor seems to be perfectly okay okay so I'll get the chassis back on the bench and we'll get this reinstalled and uh, see how it looks so I've got the chassis back on the bench we'll install the monitor it just sits on top of the platform okay so uh, there are of course uh, slotted holes in the uh, chassis of the monitor and that's to allow the monitor to be properly aligned with the opening in the main chassis so I'll get these screws refitted I'll spin the chassis round so we can have a look from the front get it aligned and then get the screws tightened down okay so that's the bolts in place before I turn the chassis around I'll just get this uh, connector put back on okay I'll get the thing turned around and we'll get the monitor aligned so looking from the front what I have to do is get the monitor uh, jiggled around so that it's fully up against the uh, front fascia and uh, once I've got it pressed right up and in the centre I can tighten down the screws and uh, it should then look fine so that's the correct place for it I'll just get the screws tightened Okay, that's the screws tightened, it's looking much better than it did before, it's nice and clean. We can see the screen burn of course, but um, as I say it will still work. Uh, all the controls that were on the uh, control panel um, are obviously now uh, fully functional. So what I can do now, turn it back round and we'll look at uh, reconnecting power to the monitor. So that's the monitor refitted, bolted into place. I've reconnected the uh, ribbon cable so it's all in position we just now need to hook up the mains power before I do that one thing I just mentioned is that when I had this spun around the other way I noticed that the control panel wasn't properly centered in the uh, front panel of the main chassis so off camera before I spun this back round I just slackened off the screws that hold it in place centered it and then retightened the screws so uh, you'll notice when we spin this back round that those controls are now properly centered okay so what I need to do now is get the mains power hooked up for the monitor if you recall that's connected through this strange um, umbilical uh, mains cable and uh, the fuse holder needs to be mounted to the bracket that bolts to the rear of the chassis so that's this bracket uh, I've since uh, recovered this um, stripped it, repainted it 
I will need to take this off again later on to refit the interface cables but for now I'll just bolt it in place so that we can uh, mount the fuse holder and connect the mains to the uh, monitor. OK, so that's the bracket in place. This of course protrudes through the opening in the uh, rear panel and the fuse holder just pops into this part of the bracket of course the ground will connect to one of the uh, chassis grounds which is down here and the mains power just plugs directly into the monitor okay so I'll just get the ground cable connected Okay, that's now in place. This will need routing properly through this intermediate uh, connector once that's refitted, um, but for now I'll leave this just sort of hanging out the back. And um, although I can't run the monitor because we don't have the electronics fitted yet, uh, this will allow me to properly route all the cables once I start reconnecting the interconnect board. There's quite a few cables go into that. Uh, and that will be the next job is in the next video I'll fit the interconnect module and then I will start fitting the cards to the electronics box and we'll see if um, the machine will start to come back to life. Uh, any comments welcome. Um, if you're not interested in this sort of thing then obviously um, you can skip these videos. It does get a bit tedious uh, watching the uh, various parts get bolted back together uh, but hopefully we'll start seeing uh, a bit more life in this before too much longer.